The Commonwealth is a family, a group of people in harmony with each other, who live to the same pattern and assist each other to greater security and good living. This they do by maintaining contact, by using their power of communicating to each other their joys, their fears, their problems and their plans. International Telex is the great aid to business. No, he's wrong. The consignment definitely left Melbourne on the 23rd. I have the Telex here. Send this. Johnson wired this morning. Verifying date of consignment. It will arrive London Friday as promised. Suggest you inquire London office airline for further details. For international news, the press depends on the photo telegram. Here, Tom. Blimey, what a job. Fancy having to send those Aussies pictures of our men getting out. Hold the front page, George. The picture's just through from London. Bold, clean as a whistle. It's a beauty. And the telephone, an essential part of the daily life of us all. Oh, it's wonderful to hear your voice. When they said London calling, I nearly cried. Yes, I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Now listen, Jean, I want to kill two birds with this call. Can you contact Jacobs at the Wool Brokers in Sydney for me? Ring him from Wagga, you mean? Until recently, intercommunication on a global basis was possible only by radio. Radio which has provided and is still providing an excellent service. But only 13 radio channels have been available to handle all telephone calls between Australia, New Zealand, North America and Europe. Now, through a single 80-channel cable, the people of the Commonwealth will be able to call the world clearly, quickly, easily by telegraph, teleprinter, phototelegram, telephone. The first task was to link Britain with Canada. The Atlantic Cable was opened by Her Majesty the Queen on the 19th of December, 1961. W.T. Smith and Sons, good afternoon. Cable from Canada, oh yes, we're expecting that. I'll take it down. Smith's on Manchester. Can fulfill order by end of month. Well, advise them. If they could send us through the cable, I'd take it that way. Then ring the old man and tell him we're in business. We'll have it all sewn up before he has time to doze off again. Now Australia has been linked with New Zealand. And work has commenced on the final stage of a tremendous project as New Zealand is being linked with Canada. A microwave link spanning Canada will join the cables which will complete the Pacific operation known as COMPAC, the Commonwealth Pacific Cable. By 1963, the world will be spanned and the nations of the Commonwealth join. Control of the project rests with the Pacific Cable Management Committee. The convener is Mr. T.A. Housley, General Manager of the Overseas Telecommunications Commission of Australia. Mr. Housley, both in concept and application, this is an immense project. Will you give us some idea of what was entailed in it? The problem was to see whether we could lay uh, 8,000 miles of cable of a new type in the great depths of the Pacific, incorporate in it some 330 submerged repeaters which would want to operate for about 20 years, um, and uh, cope with a project which would cost about 33 million. Incidentally, there were buildings to be built along the route and at the terminals, uh, uh, a ship had to be provided. It was uh, ultimately built by cable and wireless. Um, then there was the, the, the matter of agreement to operate in various places. What we finally came to was that the scheme was feasible financially and technically. We found the means of, uh, of financing it between the four partners. Uh, it is in fact a complete partnership uh, venture between uh, Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. From the point of view of the general public, what services will the cable provide? Cable will provide high-grade telephone, telex, uh, telegraph and other types of uh, communications to New Zealand, Fiji, Canada, uh, Britain and all of Europe, through Canada uh, to the United States and other places that can be reached via the United States. And in Honolulu it will interconnect with uh, an even wider system. In addition to the 
great improvement in quality, there will be a big increase in capacity. And we would expect that uh, waiting for an overseas telephone call in these areas will be a thing of the past. The spirit of partnership behind this vast project has been carried to the supply of raw materials. Steel, for instance, from Britain. This is where we're making steel for the core of the cable. One of the raw materials from Canada is aluminium. We're using top grade aluminum for the conductor tape. And another is polythene from Australia. We're making polythene for protection and insulation. From the materials of the Commonwealth, the modern miracle cable is made in the United Kingdom. For strength, a core of steel. Then a conductor of copper for the signal one way. Polythene for insulation. Then the return conductor of aluminium. Insulation again from screening tapes to prevent a leakage. Impregnated cotton keeps out corrosion. And an outer sheath of polythene protects an inch and a quarter of metal, cotton and plastic. But perfect quality cannot be maintained by the cable alone. Any conducted signal is subject to fading, inevitable diminishing of power. To counteract this, amplifiers are placed at regular intervals to boost the signal back to its original strength. A signal starts on its course through the cable, fades, is boosted back, fades again. But telephone conversations are two-way affairs. So in the one fraction of time, each amplifier must be capable of boosting a vast number of different signals coming simultaneously from east and west. The amplifiers, known here as repeaters, are precision instruments which must be capable of operating perfectly three to four miles below the surface of the ocean for at least 20 years without human attention of any kind. To ensure this precision, within a long tubular metal case is housed a mass of intricate electrical apparatus. Perfect operation under the extreme conditions will be possible only if each component, each fragment, is itself perfect. To prevent tarnishing, metal parts are gold-plated. And all components are carefully tested and checked, in some cases for a full year, before being passed as suitable for assembly. There's almost a hospital atmosphere surrounding the assembly. A repeater must not fail, so no impurity must be allowed to slip in. While British factories were assembling and manufacturing the repeaters and cable for compact, equally important equipment was being installed in the big new terminal buildings in Sydney and Auckland. Like the repeaters, these are huge assemblies of electrical apparatus, bewildering intricacies of precision equipment installed to carry the millions of messages we'll wish to send across the seas and the millions of words which will be spoken. For months, the technicians work on the installation. Screwing, welding, soldering, lining up, testing. To install the equipment which will supplement the cable which will link Auckland, New Zealand with Sydney, Australia. Then the cable itself is made. Underground first, from the terminal buildings to the sea. In Sydney, it tunnels from Paddington to world-famous Bondi Beach summer playground of a city where Sydney siders forget their worries to think of nothing more serious than the sun, the sand and the surf. But beneath them, beneath the breakers, beneath the sea itself, away across the Tasman to New Zealand, that's where the cables go. In New Zealand there's considerably more land for the cable to cross, the entire width of the North Island. From Uruwai Beach on the west coast, it travels through lovely farming country. 22 miles from the coast to the terminal building at Takapuna, an Auckland suburb. And on two miles to Takapuna Beach on the east coast, where it will wait for the final crossing of the Pacific. Winter now at Bondi and early morning. The crowds have left the beach free for the laying of the shore ends. This is the task of the cable ship retriever. First, the preparation. A deep trough is gouged through the sand, a rope is lowered away from the ship. This boat is the objective of well-known surfing identity, Orb Laidlaw. 
as if he were forcing through the breakers to a rescue. Powerful strokes take him and the line out to the boat. A great surfing beach, and Bondi men know they're surf. No rescue this. It's the rope end he's bringing back, but it's standard life-saving procedure. The belt man with the rope is eased smoothly through the breakers by the linesman on the beach. A familiar sight here. But this isn't familiar. This is a guide rope, and it must be hauled up over the beach so that the cable may be winched ashore. Now the rope in its turn draws the cable in from retriever. But the cable is not dragged along the ocean bed. At intervals, plastic floats are attached to it, inflated to ease it gently to the beach. Work has already been going for some hours, and a haze has settled over the bay. And now the cable's coming ashore. Armoured here for protection against rocky foreshore, ship's anchors and trawls. Their job done when they reach the water's edge, the floats are cut away. So that the cable can be manhandled up through the ditch in the sand. It's quite a tug of war team that's needed for the job. Heavy work and not easy on the hands. But over the beach it's eased. To the cable room under the esplanade. Here it's spliced to the section which has been tunneled through from the Paddington terminal. Paddington is joined, and Retriever can lay the shore end off Bondi. Fifteen miles out, the end is marked by a boy and left. Here it will wait for the next phase. Now the laying of the cable between Australia and New Zealand. The shore end aboard, Captain Bates of Her Majesty's telegraph ship Monarch, moves his vessel off on its long, steady voyage. Speed and course allow the smooth and constant paying out of the cable from the immense tanks in Monarch's bowers. Through a maze of guides and pulleys, the cable is tracked to the stern, where it slides over the chute to the ocean bed. And throughout every mile of the journey, checks are made through the cable with Paddington, and the findings recorded. And then the repeaters. Two turns to the repeater. Two turns. One turn to the repeater. One turn to the repeater. Bait lifting. Bait lifting. Clear of the cone. Clear of the cone. Clear of the tank. Clear of the tank. Repeater moving. Every 26 miles a repeater is laid. A most intricate operation. Men are stationed the length of the ship to guide the component on its way. It's always a moment of tension when a repeater goes in. Even the crewmen who are off duty watch anxiously to make sure there's no hitch. A clever ball device trips the cable and the repeater aside from the wheels, while a rope takes its place. It's a moment for concentration and care. Close to the stern now, the last fittings are attached. And over it goes. Yes, that's a parachute, an ordinary parachute. But here it does its work underwater. Interesting this, worth a moment's study. Instead of air, it's water that billows out the silk. But as in the air, the parachute steadies the fall of the object it's supporting. The repeater drops gently to the ocean bed, a controlled drop with the strain distributed smoothly and evenly. But if there were no parachute, gravity would dominate the descent, and the heavy repeater would drop almost straight to the bottom. The cable on the one side would develop slack, and on the other, carry all the strain. So for complete efficiency, the repeater hits the silk. A parachute made to serve man in one element proves quite as effective in another. The repeater down, it's back to routine. Until next time. To achieve absolute perfection in operation, an equalizer is laid after every twelfth repeater. So it goes on, steadily, efficiently, without fuss. Cable, repeaters, equalizers slide over the stern and sink gently to the Tasman's bed. And the Tasman is not always kind to seafaring men. Through fair weather and foul, the cable goes down, until at last the Tasman spans. 
New Zealand's not far away. And a few miles from the coast is a buoy marking the shore end. Our course should take us right to it. Still, the engineers check with the terminal, ensuring that the cable already laid is operating perfectly. But this time, there's a difference. That's it, Bannington. This is the last call from Monarch. They've got the shore end aboard now and should be splicing any time. Good on you, Monarch. We'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Thanks for your help. Well, it's Auckland next call. Goodbye and good luck. Next time those switches are thrown, there'll be a different voice on the line. A different country. Already Auckland is waiting. Nothing yet. It should be through any minutes. It's on board and they're splicing it now. Two tiny strands of metal and plastic edging together to bind two cities a thousand miles apart. Important though this moment is, it's the technician's job and he's done it before. But there are others who are waiting for a new era which will start with the union of two pieces of cable. Sydney calling Auckland. Sydney calling Auckland. Do you hear me, please, Auckland? Hello there, Sydney. Yes, this is Auckland. And you sound as though you're ringing from just next door. That's good. Well, I think we'd better check our line counts. Engineer talks to engineer under a thousand miles of ocean. Stage one of Compaq is complete. It's more than the linking of Sydney and Auckland. The huge communications networks which feed into those cities have also been linked. Now, when the switch girl at the city exchange throws home a plug, distance ceases to exist. Dunedin, you were calling Kalgoorlie. You're through now. Hello, George. How are you? Well, that's why I rang. Yes, I'm coming through to Perth next week. And it's more than a mere phone link. While voices chatter beneath the sea, telegrams can be transmitted, teleprinters can tap their messages, and still photographs can be transmitted. And simultaneously, with no interference from this activity, the cable can relay from one country to the other broadcast programs. Still, this is only part of the immense capacity of the modern miracle cable. It can carry not merely one two-way telephone conversation, but 80 at the same time. And each telephone circuit can be split again to carry up to 60 telegraph or teleprinter messages. And in addition to telephone calls, the circuits can be used for the transmission of photographs or of broadcast programs. In the service of the community, literally thousands of signals can be carried simultaneously, accurately and perfectly through a single cable only an inch and a quarter thick which lies on the ocean's bed. Traffic will flow through the cable from London to Europe. At Honolulu, it will interconnect with the United States cable which links that city with San Francisco and all the Americas. So direct communication will be possible between almost any parts of Australia, New Zealand, the Americas and Europe through the great linking core of the Commonwealth cable system. Now, will you give me John Layton at Southern Industries, please? Today, we take our communications for granted. It's the simplest operation to pick up a telephone and call a friend or colleague one, ten or twenty miles away. We can do it with ease, with the guarantee of perfect clarity and with a total disregard for distance. Our lives are close. We know and understand each other because contact is so easy. Now this contact and understanding will grow as Australians and New Zealanders communicate regularly and easily with associates as far apart as London, New York, New York, and Paris. Conceived and built as a family project by the member nations of the British Commonwealth, the benefits of the Commonwealth cable will spread far beyond the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. With the completion of the Pacific Link, the peoples of the entire continents of Europe and America will be in easy communication with those of the southern nations. And then the Federation of Malaya and Singapore will join their fellow Commonwealth nations to extend the cable link to Southeast Asia. So Asia too will be joined to the vast network linking all the major continents of the world. Between the nations will develop a bond, 
the bond of communication through a slim cable, the Commonwealth cable, which circles the Earth on the ocean's bed.